Okay, and we're coming back. Uh, we're here uh, at six years later, a leftover chat. Uh, I am Ethan. I am in the United States, and I have seen the show more times than a person ever should. Uh, and I'm here with Benji, who is in the UK, who has not seen the show at all. Hey, Benji. Hey. We uh, actually got some subscribers since last time, so that's cool. Um, and we did um, a little reaction video with you for this episode of Most Powerful Adversary. And it's gotten some did. action, so. Um, won't come in. <laughs> uh, yeah, we'll probably do one for uh, the next episode, International Anything Assassin. Use. Yeah. So like, subscribe, do all the stuff. It makes us feel real good. It keeps us going, right? Exactly. I'm going to give a little rundown of where I was at watching TV when these uh, episodes started to air. So um, if anyone wants to skip this, I'll put a, a, a time tag, um, down, a timestamp in the description so you can skip right to the episode. This shouldn't be too long anyway. Um, I just want to tell you what was going on at the time. Me and my wife were being very dutiful nerds, and we were watching The Walking Dead every Sunday at 9. Right? Because that was the show, and it was actually okay at that time, and I think it was in its fourth season. And slowly over the weeks, I started to say, hey, can we watch The Leftovers first? You know, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm timid, and that's what I asked my wife to do. And um, it got to be so much that I think for the last two episodes, I watched it separately. And after this episode, we watched the leftovers at nine o'clock every night and waited to watch the walking dead. And I have a part two to that story after next week's episode. Um, and by the way, I do not watch the walking dead anymore. Uh, I'm, I'm good on zombies. Do you watch the walking dead? Uh, I don't, but if we ever run out of material to talk about, there's a, <laughs> oh. if we really start scraping the barrel. Patty, help us. Hopefully that doesn't happen. Right. right. Um, okay, so we're at uh, The Leftovers, uh, season two, episode seven, The Most Powerful Adversary. Overall, what did you think of the episode? Uh, it was um, confusing. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to stick with confusing because I don't think I can come up with a better word than that. Um, but I mean, that's really the beauty of it is that I enjoy watching it and I enjoy knowing that no matter how confused I am in the episode before, another episode's going to come along and it's just going to top it. So if that's where we are, episode seven, you know, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to where it's going to go from there. Because uh, when I say confused, I don't mean that in a bad way. It, I mean it in the sense that I really don't have the story's going to go I, I don't feel like I can predict what's about to happen and that's quite an exhilarating thing because it's almost when it's the opposite of that and you're watching a tv show and you almost know exactly where it's going to go before it goes there it just doesn't give the same experience as watching a show like this where you genuinely have no idea what's about to happen from one moment to the next and that's kind of how I would sum up this episode well I mean yeah specifically with what happens at the end of this episode um right yeah. it's not the end of spoiler alert is not the end of the first season of game of thrones you know it's mm -hmm. it's uh you know we're mid we're almost mid season we have three episodes left after this and it just ends on a shocking uh we have no idea what's going to happen so uh let's get into it season two episode seven a most powerful adversary last time we saw our heroes it was uh the nora and erica showdown and right when we left, um, Kevin had explained to Nora that he has been seeing the dead Patty Levin. Um, so at the cold open, Kevin Garvey wakes up handcuffed to his bed with Patty letting him know that Nora is gone. She says Nora snuck out in the middle of the night. Kevin does not believe her and calls Jill to get his bolt cutters as he cannot find the key to the handcuffs. Patty continues on, on how about all the color in the world uh, disappeared on the day Neil left her. Patty warns Kevin not to tell Jill about her. Jill opens the letter Nora left. Mary and the baby are with me. Don't call. Jill leaves her father in disgust, and Patty reiterates that it's going to be a hard day. Oh, Credit, credits. She wasn't wrong. B. Huh? She wasn't wrong. No, she was not wrong. Um, 
The only thing I have to say is this is the first time we get a lot of Jill leaving a room angry this episode. This season, really. This season, really. She's almost she's almost been reduced really yeah. to that yeah. to that. Which is, I think I mentioned a few times in the early episodes that I found that quite nice to see Jill, who'd obviously been so pent up and emotional in season one, to kind of have a few episodes where she doesn't have to be the one dealing with all this burden and trauma. Um, but it definitely feels like <laughs> she needs bringing back into the back into the game, so to speak. Um, I don't think her development stopped the minute we got to seven, uh, season two. Yeah. Um, well, but she it definitely has- feel like, like you say, there's a few episodes where she was really, she was not the one with the problems. Right. And she has some this episode. Um, mm-hmm. I'll continue. Kevin drives around calling Nora while Patty tells him he, she hopes they will reconcile very sincerely, I think. Um, sorry, I'm being sarcastic. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jill goes to see Michael in the church to complain about her father's relationship. She tells him that her dad sleepwalks and that he talks to someone that is not there. Michael seems intrigued. Jill lets out some frustration about Michael not willing to have sex with her. He said it isn't religion that's keeping them apart, but his willingness to dive into a physical relationship with someone he doesn't know that well yet. Jill leaves in disbelieving anger this time. Um, She's just uh, from, you know, she's from the modern age where guys that have integrity like Michael don't exist, I think. We say Michael has integrity. um, Maybe come back to that at the end of the episode. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, no, there was, this was a moment actually where, uh, so we watched this episode together and then you kind of told me I should definitely, most definitely rewatch it by myself. Um, and so when I was rewatching it by myself, this was an episode where it was kind of, it feels like anytime we're in a chapel in the leftovers, they really make the most of it. Um, so for example, in, in episodes with Matt, where he's been in the chapel, there's been really kind of specific scriptural references uh visually that 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 link quite nicely to the content so i thought you know maybe that's going on again here there was um there was a scripture acts 8 38 that was uh on the wall we there was a, a couple of shots where it was pretty prominent in the background and i was wondering did you did you take a look at that reference or or if not do you want me to just go over it quickly now no and we've done it people we've turned benji into a leftovers watcher this is this is how <laughs> This is how the show was watched. Yeah, go for it. Okay. Well, yeah, see, because when I'm doing this kind of thing, I'm like, you know what? Maybe it's totally, totally me making up stuff that isn't there. But at the same time, you know, I'd, I'd rather do that than not, just in case I'm, I'm occasionally right. You know, I'd rather miss 20 times and get it right once than not at all. So the the actual scripture is Acts 3, 38. But I went, sorry, not Acts 3, Acts 8, 38. Um, but I thought, well, I might as well look at the whole chapter and see see what else sticks out. There was actually, there was one uh, kind of passage that I thought was pretty cool. And that's uh, towards the middle of the chapter, Acts 8, 18 to 20. I'll read it real quick for you now. It's not that long. And it, it goes like this. Uh, and when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered the money saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. So I don't know about you, but when I read that, I'm instantly thinking about uh, stuff from the early episodes where we see all the tourists coming in, and they're trying to buy like the holy water from Miracle, and um, Michael saying, No, I can't sell you this. Like, this isn't something I can sell you. Maybe take a donation, but it's not, you, you can't buy this. And it's the idea of you can't, you can't buy your way into this miracle power, like like Nora did with the buying the house, but it's not really saved them. Um, like all these tourists are trying to do with the water, but it's not, it's not saving them. It's a great parallel that also points out, again, Michael's integrity compared to some other folks because he wouldn't, he would take a donation. But then you got later Dr. Goodhart selling five thousand dollars for a for a milliliter of the water yeah um so that was really the big kind of when i was reading that that chapter i was like okay that's the one that sticks out the most to me um 
there's a couple other bits. Act eight, when I look at the, um, you can look at like summaries of the chapter and cliff notes. <laughs> uh, maybe if you wanted to actually have a, a dedicated app with my, uh, scriptural library on, so it's, it's got it on there. Um, but in this chapter, miracles are performed. There is one other thing, which is we should probably look at the, the exact scripture that's up on the wall. There's probably uh, there's probably a reason they, they chose 38. Yeah, what does it say? Um, it says, and he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they both uh, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Who's Philip? He's a, a holy man. There's obviously there's references to water, and we all know okay. season two there's uh, there's been a lot of focus on water, so that's one. And there's also a eunuch, and I may be totally off the mark here, but I, I'm gonna t- slight spoilers when um when Kevin visits. Uh, Michael's grand grandfather later in the episode. Can't spoil Doesn't the episode. You can't spoil the episode we're talking about. He talks about the fact he was shot in the groins, right? Yes. So does that? <laughs> I never thought I'd be asking this. But does that make him a eunuch? If we're giving out internet points for uh, for dots connected, you just won big, I would say. So read the quote again. Uh. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down, both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized them. My mind is blown. This is what a lapsed Jewish man's mind blown looks like. That's, that's a good one. It's okay. a really good one. Um, wow, that, I'm going to be sitting with that one for a while. Mm-hmm. Good job, buddy. Uh, and when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Man, I can't even comment. I can't comment on what... what right, you're we can come back to that. Out. Yeah, no, I mean, wow. Uh, onward um, with Kevin. Kevin goes to the locksmith who is helping a child learn a language using flashcards. He tries, but is unable to get the locksmith to take the cuffs off due to some unfortunate timing while screaming at Patty. Oh yeah, um, very unfortunate. Yeah, and the locksmith part was really interesting for me um, because it was one of the main themes of the episode that I picked up on was the idea of being uh, locked or bonded or trapped or caged, kind of any of those words. Um, and it starts with, obviously, when Kevin wakes up and he's handcuffed at the bed. And I'm from that moment on until maybe two thirds of this episode, we're dealing with like the repercussions of that. So there's this visual representation of Kevin being locked with the with the with the handcuffs and he can't get it off. But then there's also there's more more than just that in in the not so visual plane of this episode. Um, so for example, there's Kevin's kind of bond of Patty and it's pretty clear to us that he's sort of locked to, locked to her, bonded to her, or there's some kind of connection that he can't seem to shake and he can't seem to break. And in fact, the whole point of this episode is him trying to break that bond uh, and go into pretty extreme lengths to do that. And it's sort of, you have those two parallel uh, little storylines going on. You have him physically trying to break out of this handcuff lock and not meeting a lot of success, and at the same time, trying to break out of his bond with Patty, and they're both sort of running, running alongside each other. Obviously, one of them with more dire consequences than the other, but uh, it just felt like a visual kind of visual representation of that to me. Um, and and there is more kind of symbols I picked on in this episode to do with that idea of being locked or trapped. So we can come back to it. I'm curious who you think has more dire consequences. I mean, I want to say Kevin. <laughs> right. Maybe but, just because he's physically alive. Right. It's like, what does Patsy have to lose at this point? Yeah, it was pretty funny watching him curse at a child at the locksmith. <laughs> and he's so, he looks so deranged while he does it. 
I mean, this whole episode, I don't know how they did it. Like, did they just make him do, like, run a few miles before each take? Because he was sweating so much. Uh, they're working in Texas, man. It's hot, and he's an actor. So, I, you know, mm. I just assume it's there and costuming and everything. Um, yeah. But, I mean, he just looks like not the kind of person you'd want in your shop. Yeah, he's he's... Well, yeah, I mean, it totally comes in. His He's got the handcuff half on. Mm-hmm. He's sweaty. You're just trying to, you know, work on some. But I wonder if this is a weekday or not. Isn't that kid supposed to be in school? Anyway. Uh, Miracle Texas, man. Right. So, um, yeah, man, they're, they're the spared. Exactly. So I have an audio clip for the next part. This is my audio clip of Kevin after his break in the car. Minute ten seconds. Why do you keep following me? If you want me to do something, just fucking say it. I'm glad you finally asked, Kevin. There is something you need to do. In Cairo, Egypt, there is an ancient artifact. It's in a museum now. They found it in the tomb of Amenhotep. Scholars call it the wishing cup. You need to acquire this cup. It's more of a chalice, actually. It's going to be heavily guarded, but you need to get it any way you can. Because once you do, you need to fill it with your cum, Kevin. And then you need to drink it down. Every last drop. Jesus, Kevin! I have no fucking idea what you're supposed to do. Now, it was right here during your um, um, reaction video that I knew we were going to be okay with the reaction video. Um, so, when this is happening, and before it gets to the, to the money shot, if you will, of the speech, what, what, what were you thinking? Were you thinking, I mean, she says Cairo, right? Yeah. Right, and Cairo is obviously fairly significant. So it's like, okay, okay, Cairo, Cairo. And then, I don't know, it's 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 a combination. It's it's the fact that Pais actually sounds serious uh, for once, and, and Kevin's there, and he's like nodding along, and the music is serious. And, you know, I've, I feel like I've done this way too many times watching this, watching this show, but I... I just bought it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I really no, shouldn't be admitting that, but I just did. Well, I was like, you're buying it too till they tell you not to buy it. Right. Demon Azrael. Mm-hmm. Drinking a couple yeah, of Yeah, exactly. Right. So this is basically Damon Lindelof and his writers um, saying, hey, you, you there in England, reading the scripture and diving into the scripture. Mm-hmm here's something that we're going to tease you with. Right. Um, so that's all that was. Um, yeah. Is it closing time in England? Is that what's going on? Uh, no, I'm in a building with motion sensitive lights. So, <laughs> okay. Um, so Patty goes on to explain that she doesn't want to be there and is just lo- as lost as Kevin. Kevin begs Patty to go away. And this is witnessed by Michael who says, I know you went to see him, but it didn't work. Kevin doesn't remember. Michael is able to name check Patty and reminds Kevin that Virgil can help him get rid of Patty. So I'm just going to skip to Virgil's Virgil's house. Mm -hmm. Uh, At Virgil's house with Michael waiting outside, Virgil tells Kevin of the night of the the girls disappeared. Kevin came over to Virgil's house and explained how Patty had been with him since her suicide that he witnessed. Kevin asked Virgil, how to get rid of her. Virgil explained that Patty isn't in Kevin, but rather on Kevin. And the only way to get rid of her is to do it from quote unquote, the other place. And the way to get there is to die. Virgil told Kevin, a guide was required to go with you, but Kevin was in such a hurry that he grabbed a cinder block and ran off to drown himself. And Virgil says, quote, drowning isn't the best way, no exit strategy and no guide. Virgil explains, He also says the earthquake that happened at the moment meant that Kevin either had someone special looking out for him or he had a most powerful adversary. 
a lot of information to take in. Yeah, I mean, it's visually as well, there's a lot to take in. I was kind of, on the second time watching this, I was trying to figure out what exactly was going on in uh, Virgil's house because it's, um, there's a lot of light bulbs. Um, I didn't want to dive too deep in that just because you can go to other places and find out right. a lot about this. There is a painting. I, I don't know what it's called. Like I said, this has been covered numerous times. There's so much going on. I was just trying to cover new ground, but there's definitely a painting with, in a house like this, I think with a man that, you know, is supposed to be just like this. Okay. Well, I won't go on. Did you, but did, did, you did you know about it? No, I didn't. Okay. Well, it was, um, I was going to ask if you did know what the that like stuffed animal was about. No. No. What stuffed animal? I don't even remember. Uh, so there's, uh, I think it was about 1605 was the timestamp I got. There was some stuffed animal that was like Kevin was staring at for a fairly extended period of time. So I was like, maybe that's significant. Uh, but shameful, I did not identify the animal. Uh, I think he's probably, uh, you know, it could be something. He could be just taking it all in, you know. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, so so moving past that, all the <laughs> stuff in the house, um, in terms of the actual conversation that's going on, what I really found interesting about this was that Virgil was, um, he was sort of vindicating Kevin in a way, in a way that he hasn't really had yet. Um because I'm guessing Kevin's fear for the last few episodes has been the minute he tells people what he's seeing, people tell him he's crazy. Uh, and we've seen Nora's already gone. And, and later on in the episode, we're going to see sort of the opposite of what Virgil's saying to him and how, even though maybe it makes more sense, it doesn't resonate quite in the same way as this, because in, in, in this conversation, he's being vindicated. He's being, he feels like legitimized. He's, He's not crazy, and I don't know. He it almost feels like there's more respect being paid toward him, which is why I believe he eventually comes back around to Virgil versus the alternatives, even though it is kind of sketchy. Um, kind of sketchy. <laughs> um, because now we find out that Virgil was shot by John, hurting him a long time ago. John shot him in the chest, stomach, and his quote-unquote foul machinery below the waist. Mm -hmm. And when he went to the other place, he did battle with his adversary and was reborn. Yeah. Virgil asked Kevin if he can do the same for him. Kevin asked by killing me, and Virgil responds temporarily. Uh, it's too much for Kevin, and he leaves. Yeah. So I, I just read that part because it's a continuation mm -hmm. of um, what Virgil – has told Kevin he wants to do to him to yeah. help him, which is kill him. Right. And again, like I was saying, if it's all about just the way he says it though, because if he, it's kind of crazy when you think that this guy can be saying, okay, the solution is I kill you. But Kevin still prefers that solution to the solution of you're crazy because it's validating him. And validate maybe is the word I wanted to use before rather than vindicate. So he's been like validated by Virgil. And for that reason, he's more kind of susceptible to, to going along with this. Um, I was going to say as well, earlier in the conversation, he talked about, he talked about a guide quite a lot, right? And for me, that reminded me, I always been a fairly big fan of like Greek myth, Roman myth, um, not myth, sorry, Greek, ancient Greek like history and, and their kind of beliefs and belief system and I don't know how familiar you are with this stuff but the idea of a guide or a guide taking you into the underworld is a, a very strong theme in, in their kind of mythology Was there um, a guide in the um, the seven layers oh god I keep thinking Canterbury Tales but that's not it the seven layers of hell is there a guide there well, the guide I'm thinking of specifically is um, the guide who rows you across, rows you across the river Styx. Um, the ferryman. I believe it's called like Chiron or something. Uh, let me quickly Google that. 
I don't want to pronounce that wrong. By the way, I just want to say that this is not an endorsement of the band Sticks in any way. Thank you. Um, oh, Charon? Uh, Charon? C H A R O N. Okay. The ferryman of Hades. Um, so this is a dense one, So, but I have to get into deep and ask these questions. Um, this revelation about Virgil and his foul machinery below the waist and what happened with, I mean, it's still pretty unclear who directly it happens to. I think I have a lot more clarity watching it this time around. I think it happened directly to John. Mm -hmm. um, there were theories going around at the time that it either happened to Erica when she was a child or it happened to one of the kids because they never come out and specifically say it. But now the more I'm watching, I think um, Virgil um, abused John in some way. Was this, a, was this a revelation to you when he said it? Um, well, the revelation to me was when Patty said it in a more direct way. Right. Later on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to go on. Mm -hmm. Kevin drives into the woods and calls for Patty. They discuss why Patty lied to Kevin and why she left out the part about him seeing Virgil. She says, what would you say if I told you the answer to your problems was a magical black man at the edge of town? That's borderline racist is what that is, which is another talk to the audience moment. Kevin taunts Patty saying he knows how to get rid of her, and she quote-unquote slaps and pushes him. I say quote-unquote because from what I can tell, you never actually see anybody touch anyone. Um, now it's her turn to explode and she tells Kevin they should go back. She is eager to do battle with him and they should both go fucking die. He says he has responsibilities and he is a father and Patty says maybe Jill would be better off. There's a lot of pain and anger in her face. It's the way she delivers the line. Yeah. I am so desperate to do battle with you. <sighs> so good. And that's why I, I ask you to watch twice sometimes because... This is what we're soaking in. Um, she seems desperate. He seems desperate. And we still don't really know. Like, I still don't know. Is, is she there? I mean, I guess we'll get into some of that later, right? Right. Um, also, this is hopefully here in the, if you're looking at the screen right now, I will be putting up the first of my Lego leftovers scenes I made a while ago. Um, a couple more of those to come. So that'll be interesting. Um, okay, so as he tries, Nora again on the phone, Kevin gets a call saying, Lori is at the entrance to Miracle. Lori Garvey, back with a vengeance. Kevin and Lori haven't spoken to each other in a while, and he is surprised she's talking again. She apologizes for being there, but she just wants to talk to Tommy. He mentions where she is staying. Kevin tells her that Tommy's not here. Through her, through her worry, it becomes evident to her that not all is well with Kevin. The where is my mind piano motif comes in again. We get a big smile from Benji on the reaction video for that one. And it starts as Kevin starts to break down while claiming everything is okay. Lori notices his, his state of duress, distress, apologizes, then leave as Kevin is screaming for her to go home. So, I mean, they haven't seen each other in a while. Yeah, and it, it, it does feel kind of weird that it jumped from season one where they don't speak at all and there's a really emotional, emotional moment in the finale where she kind of screams about Jill to him. That's the sort of last contact they have. And then literally the next time they speak to each other, it's this weird, semi-polite, awkward conversation where both of them are so kind of wrapped up in their own issues that they, it, it feels like they forget they're meant to be this huge barrier between them and this huge conflict between them. It's, it feels like they're both so preoccupied with their, their bigger issues. Kevin with his, well, we all know what's going on with Kevin at this point and, and Laurie with whatever's happening to Tommy. And it's almost like that distracts them from the fact that they're meant to have this sort of antagonistic attitude towards each other. And they're just both kind of, they're just tired, I think, and they don't, they just don't have the energy to be that back and forth. So they're just in this weird kind of, oh, hey. 
And Kevin's, oh, hey. de Kevin's default setting is rage, mm. right? So, I mean, it turns very quickly to like some very, what I would call like uh, cliched type things. Yeah, that's what you do. You leave. Go ahead. Go leave when it gets tough. Good. You know what I mean? Um, and then I'm not getting into the next part yet, but. Okay. When, yeah, I had a couple more. Yeah, I know. But when he starts, well, go ahead. Um, well, first of all, the that little drum track that's playing as 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 Kevin turns and he's wearing his shades again, Return of the Shades, yeah. he's walking down. That's a really cool track. Um, he's sweating so bad as well. I noticed that as well. Like he's been sweating all episode, but this is like, whoa. It's a hard day, man. He's raging everywhere, everywhere it he is, goes. And um, yeah. Patty's overtaken him. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I was going to say, another interesting point was how the when Laurie talks about Tommy, um, the first thing, well, the first thing Kevin asks basically is whether Tommy's okay, which is still kind of, so even though he's so messed up right now, he still has his his sense of family and looking out for his family because that's i don't know what the word for that is um but that is immediately where his mind goes to like where's tommy is tommy okay almost like he's I'm, forgotten his troubles for a second well yeah and after you know and after his big fight with patty the last thing is you know he has responsibilities right uh, he's, he's a father you know what i mean and and that's always at the forefront mm -hmm. of any parent's mind yeah. And and she is she is shocked that Tommy is not there. Mm. She's amazed and she's worried. Yeah. That he's not there. And I'm starting to get an awful feeling that the next episode is going to be some kind of catch up from what's happened with Laurie and Tommy, and we're going to be focusing on them to. Because obviously, all all I want to do is watch what's coming next with Kevin. But I just I just have this feeling that's what's going to come next. Because we need and, to be caught up in that, really. Um, what And what I was going to say before is what I really like here and what you could tell in the reaction video is and it really brings the season together. They bring back where, where is my mind. Mm -hmm. They bring back the piano where is my mind, right? Mm -hmm. And in the next scene when he starts driving, it kicks into the, to the regular Pixies where is my mind. And it is such a beautiful tie-in and it gets you kind of pumped like mm. what is going next um i just love that part about about yeah. the bridging of these two scenes and the bridging of the whole season with with this song absolutely do you remember the exact moments with um we've heard it before? i remember obviously when uh there's been plenty of moments where kevin's had that song playing but there was a moment as well when that song was playing during a laurie episode right Maybe I think so. Yeah. So again, it's that kind of. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure it was. Um, so you're saying she's a piano and he's the he's the rock and they uh, kind of a little bit. Yeah, actually that wasn't, but that's probably better than what I was going to say. That that's quite good. A Peter I, kind of thing, but I gotta have to check that out. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure though. In in the Laurie episode, there was um there was some where's my mind stuff going on. Maybe you can add a little. Find out about where's my bit, mind. Say, uh, oh. okay. but I'm yeah, I'm pretty sure there was. Uh, yeah, the final thing uh, I was going to say about this was, so as Laurie's walking away, and Kevin's up against the fence, and we have that shot of him through that. We have that again. It's like a visual reminder for me of Kevin being trapped. He's got this kind of wire fence in that looks almost like a cage. And even though he's meant to be the lucky one on the inside, she's the one that's got walking away. And he's the one that stood there with this like cage around him. So he's, he's got the handcuffs, he's got the cage, he's got Patty linked to him. He's got so many, it feels like he's just trapped, right? And the fence is a barrier and it represents the barrier between the two people mentally with the physical barrier. Well, exactly. Sorry. That's well, that went about saying. That's my PBS voice. <laughs> right. Um, 
All right, so where is my mind kicks back in full as Kevin goes um, on a mission to get his cuffs off. He goes to the firehouse thinking maybe they can help, but he gets cut off guard as John is there hand printing all the men in town looking for a matching palm print for the missing, from the missing girl's car. Kevin asks about his cuffs, but the bolt cutters are gone. Um, while there, John insists Kevin gets his palm printed. He knows full well his print will be a match. John stares pure daggers at Kevin as he walks away. When he gets in the truck with Patty, she points out the firehouse that he went there to get free and he got caught. She says the only time she felt free is when she killed herself and Kevin held her. There we go. There's another another one to add to the list. Um, Kevin getting uh, caught, so to speak, in the fire, firefighter's place. Right. It's just kind of stacking up this episode. Did Elmar did Elmar sneak did no. Elmar sneak into town and steal those bolt cutters? Um, dude, Elmar. <laughs> That's not serious. I was going to try to come up with something, but I couldn't. Man. Um. Yeah, and just the way I always get like, you know, Kevin didn't really hesitate about getting his palm print done. Yeah. Um. And and John just stares at him. But I guess he couldn't, though, could he? Like, what? it's not like, I don't know. Yeah, what was he going to say? It, exactly. <laughs> no, I don't want to. Well, why not? You know. Kevin's like, I got to get like, out of this situation right now. Yeah, the smartest thing him to do is just go along with it and then uh, buy himself some time to get, get away from there. Whereas if he's immediately like, no, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it, then it's sort of going to be an immediate conflict versus postponing it. Um And... And we're back with Patty, and she is just pushing for him to go through with this thing. Mm. And she goes, man, boy, that's freedom when you don't have to breathe anymore. <laughs> you know? Uh, this line, she says, you know, you went there to get free and you got caught. Oh, yeah. I feel like she could be talking about Miracle as a whole. Sure. Like, they, the whole point of moving there was to get free, and instead he seems to have been caught and trapped and yep. locked and at least that's how he feels mm. um okay so it's night now and back at home jill and kevin talk about nora jill says it's not complicated and she asks kevin if he's pretending to want a family and if he's not please figure it out it's twice now she goes inside the house crying yeah and this reminded me of um the the Garvey's at their best episode where Kevin sort of pretends to want a dog and he pretends to want all this stuff that Laurie wants and then he sort of blows up at the end and says no I don't actually want, want it and obviously he doesn't do that here but it's the same idea of often Kevin says he wants something but he doesn't he doesn't really and so that's why Jill has every right to be asking him this well, yeah, she's caught in the middle, you know, she had some kind of home life and bam, in a day it's gone. There's no Mary Jameson. There's no, um, uh, there's no Nora. There's no Lily. She can't get laid. Her dad's a dick and her mom stopped talking to her all the time, a long time ago. So whoa, whoa is Jill. Did the dog go? What the happened dog, to the dog? The, the dog is in quarantine. It's still? 60 days they've only been uh, yeah i guess 60 days it feels like longer than that yeah well i mean the girls have been missing three or four weeks at this time i think right. um and they just got there they disappeared the night they got mm -hmm. there yeah yeah that's true kevin goes to Lori's hotel to talk and get help from her we are now in a therapy session with Lori in her old role off screen he has explained the patty situation and we join them mid conversation and they both are really enjoying a cigarette the conversation veers into their married life where he used to hide his cigarettes. And Lori breaks down Kevin and Patty's relationship and explains that since Patty isn't around when Lori is there, and, and oh, she explains that Patty isn't around when Lori is there, and that's because Lori can prove she doesn't exist. She reminds Kevin that she did tell him all about Patty's issues with her husband, breaking strict doctor-patient confidentiality. Uh, Lori also explains that Patty is in Kevin's mind and about the world after the departure. Also some information about Tommy. It got a little dense here. 
So that's when we go to my um, second audio clip, and uh, it's about two minutes. Can I tell you about belief, Kevin? When the mind is in emotional distress, it will grasp at any construct that makes it feel better. After the 14th, the whole world needed to feel better. We were all in emotional distress. So that made all of us susceptible to false belief, to be taken advantage of. And the reason I know this, Kevin, is because Tommy and I used it. We convinced people that he could take their pain away just by hugging them. But we had a story. We made it up, but it worked. And, I mean, Tommy hated it, the lying. And I said it didn't matter as long as we were helping people. But he disagreed. And we had a, uh, we had a, had a, had a fight, and he, he said that he, he couldn't. What I'm trying to say that they believed it. Every single person that he laid his hands on. Because their brains would sooner embrace magic than deal with feelings of, of fear and abandonment and guilt. And all of us turned to someone who could just turn it off. Why do you think I joined a fucking cult? And now you are manifesting the leader of that cult because you need someone to turn it off. There is no Patty, Kevin. There is only you. She sounds pretty on point here. To my ears. What do you think? <gasps> yeah. Well, you know I've not been a huge fan of Laurie this season. And I don't feel like <laughs> this scene really helped that much. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Laura. <laughs> but look, okay, she's there and she's, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give her credit where credit's due. She's, she's out there dropping logic and reason and facts and kind of speaking like a normal person, not like a crazy person. But I just don't want to listen to her. And I feel like, I feel like as an invested viewer, I don't want Kevin to listen to her. Yeah, well, because she's, she's coming at a point from straight psychiatrist. And, and the whole thing is like, once you leave your kid to join a cult, like you might be able to work your way back from that at some point, but you're not going to start doling out advice. Yeah, and it's this whole like holier than thou thing that Laurie has had going on this whole season um, about like how she's the one out there exposing the cults and she's writing the books and it, it just frustrates me seeing seeing some Laurie like this. It, it's almost the opposite of Virgil, right? What I was talking about earlier where you just don't like we, because obviously we're invested in, in, we feel more like the Kevin side of the conversation than Laurie. Like we are Kevin in this conversation and we just don't feel validated. And, and because we don't feel validated, we don't want to listen to her. And it's like, it's just not, she's the one popping the balloon, right? She's out of a needle. She's just popping the balloon. That's her job. I'm going to remember you said that later. One of the big deals for me in this conversation was moving back to, Patty and her being whether she's kind of verifiable or not. And I think I spoke about this earlier in the season where in the moments where Patty was talking about stuff that only she could have known or apparently only she could have known. And I was saying, and, um, that's kind of a big deal. That's like, that is the, the big deal, whether legitimizes whether or not she is really external to Kevin's mind. And Laurie sort of really hits the nail on the head here as well, where she's saying, the reason she's not here is because she's not actually verifiable. Um, so Patty still doesn't have her orange sticker. Exactly. Yeah. Right. But it's just the way it's not what she says. It's how she says it. And she just says it with a depth and sure. Sure. Surety that you, you think only the real Patty would be able to say it like that. Well, I mean, there's, there's two things that come to mind when you say this. One, I think about how long were Kevin 
and Lori married, and is that long enough for her to drone on and on, breaking patient confidentiality every night about many patients, and there's all sorts of random information swimming around in his head that he doesn't know he knows. That's one side way to think about it. And I guess the other one is uh, about the emotion. First of all, the acting is amazing, but it's also like uh, my point at the end of the first season is, you know, Kevin and Patty are much more alike than, than Kevin ever wants to admit. If he's manifesting that emotion from her, you know, he's in a horrible state as well. Laurie said when she talks, she has a big kind of, she has a big moment where she's talking about beliefs and we turn to these beliefs because they can, uh, to phrase it, turn it off. You know, in what way is Patty having this belief that Patty's there and she's talking to him in some weird afterlife state? How is that exactly making Kevin feel better and how is that turning it off for him? So I think it's pretty clear so far that it's, tr it's really not helped him and it's not made him feel better. You're absolutely right. What she's saying is he's more willing to accept the magic or whatever it is of mm -hmm. a person being there than the truth, which is he needs to be like his father and, and given medication and put into an institution. Mm -hmm. And again, it goes back to... What she's telling him. Yeah, it goes back to the, the con contrast between Virgil and Laurie and how Virgil's proposing this downright stupid solution. <laughs> I will kill you and that's going to solve it. Versus Laurie who's really, you know, it's quite a reasonable solution. Go get yourself a med. Get yourself a Mets, Kevin. What did you think of what she said about Tommy and their what what happened with them? You want to see it? Well, I don't. Um, I don't know if I do want to see it because we've only got a few episodes left, and right now I want to be moving forward rather than the fact that she's told us what happened is kind of like, do I need? It would be useful to see it, but I'd rather have three episodes of what happens next rather than two of what happened before and one of what happened next, you know? Cool. So she says, Kevin decides that he will bring Lori into Miracle to help him work through his Patty issue, and she reluctantly agrees. Okay, yeah. I was just going to finalize, kind of smooth out that whole section with uh, one kind of thing, which is, I think the thing that really annoys me about this is how Lori kind of represents to me the, the type of people that they're so ready to kind of tear down other people's beliefs but they don't really, there's no kind of positive construction. And, you know, it's always easier to tear down other people's beliefs than, you know, build your own up or, or help others build theirs up. And I don't, I don't know, I have more respect for people that do the latter than the former, which is just kind of ripping stuff down. And it's, that's sort of what she's representing to me here. Well, that's what and she that's, did. That's, why that's, that's what she did in her whole episode. She took these, that girl, lady out of her life. She didn't put anything in its place. She mm -hmm. went back to her family, and she ended up driving the, on the off-ramp, killing her family, right? Sorry, I stepped Yeah, we can talk more about Lori uh, yeah. later. Okay. Kevin brings Lori into their house and apologizes about being a dick when she wanted to get a dog. He says he thinks about it a lot, and she forgives him. Nora calls Kevin, and she asks him to stop calling. She cannot deal with him seeing a dead woman. Kevin asked Nora if there was a way he could free himself from Patty. Would she believe him if he told her it worked? He emphasizes that he would never lie to her, ever. She said she would believe him and she would come back. It, it's a really emotional moment and both Kevin and Nora, the emotion they managed to deliver in just like the few lines. So, so for example, when, when Nora's saying, I'd like that, is so like raw and I think it's this that pushes Kevin to go to Virgil in that he needs he needs this being fixed now <laughs> like he can't afford to to go down Laurie's path and wait and well for one he'll have Laurie in the house which is probably not a good idea if he wants Nora to come back two he's going to be you know on meds or whatever or he may have to go away somewhere and that's just not he's not going to be able to get Nora and Jill and Lily and the whole family that they've created back together without taking some kind of a risk and going to, to Virgil. I think it's a combination of what I was talking about earlier and how he feels more validated by Virgil, but also the fact that 
Virgil's solution is really the only one that allows him to, to get Nora back now. I think you're right. And I think what you said about Lori, you know, Jill finding Lori at home. I don't, I don't know how much Kevin even thought about that, mm. but Jill is pissed off, obviously. Mm -hmm. And she wants to call her dad, but he's driven off. Yeah. How do you get out of the house? Um, I think it has multiple ways. He found the, he found the handcuff mm. key by the note that Patty was blocking in the morning. <laughs> such a random moment as well when, when they're on the phone and she's like, no, it's, oh. it's on the sofa. And he's like, oh, she was blocking it. And she just goes, uh, oh. <laughs> Right. Which, I don't know. That's a... That is kind of, yeah, that's a, like... That's a real... That's a checkbox for Patty's reel. And is it actually there? I mean, uh, yeah, like... Because <laughs> he was... He didn't want to be in those handcuffs. Like, if he had seen that, he would have... Mm. All right. So, I'm going to read the last scene of the show, and then we'll talk about it, okay? Mm-hmm. Kevin hears Michael and Virgil arguing about something through the door. Michael is clearly upset and reluctantly leaves. Kevin is ready to go ahead with the plan. Virgil pours Kevin a cocktail of poison that he says will stop his heart temporarily. Virgil explains that after Kevin drinks the poison and it works, he will give him a shot of epinephrine well before the poison completely kills Kevin. Virgil also mentions the guy in the pillar is his leaving, living, breathing success story. Before Kevin drinks, he has one last conversation with Patty in which she tries to stop him. She's having second thoughts and wonders if they can trust Virgil. Kevin asks Patty if she wants him to do this. She's pretty unconvincing, but says she definitely wants him to do it. He says his father was cured because he finally did what the voices told him to do. As Patty screams, Kevin drinks the poison and it works immediately. He's had a bad seizure and loses complete consciousness. Virgil empties out the epinephrine on the floor, throws a syringe on the ground, takes out a gun and shoots himself in the mouth. A horrified, Ke uh, horrified but not completely shocked Michael comes in and starts dragging Kevin's corpse away. And that's the end of the episode. I'm still confused. Okay. But no, yeah, there's obviously there's stuff to dissect here that, that I can talk about. Um, and, and, you first know, of all, yeah. We don't need to if you don't want to. It, it's, you know, it, on many levels, it speaks for itself. Mm. And it basically says, what are you doing? Watch the next episode of the show, <laughs> you know? Um, but, I mean, there's stuff to talk about, for sure. Yeah, well, mainly I actually wanted to talk about Michael because, like you said, Michael and Virgil are arguing. They're arguing about something. Um and then, but then later when, so there's, there's those two kind of weird moments going on with Michael. First, when he's arguing with Virgil, and then second, when he comes back in, and even though he's a little bit like, you know, that's kind of gross, man, he's still, he's not like in shock. So it's almost like he knows what to do. Almost like he's been given some kind of instruction. Right. And perhaps those instructions were what he was arguing against. Um, I mean, you know, his main main look is he sees that his grandfather is dead. Right. Not passed out from a seizure because he drank something that could knock you out forever or could kill you or just mm -hmm. knock you out for a long time, which we don't know what Kevin drank, actually. Or, or anything like that, like Virgil shot his head off. His grandfather's dead. No exit strategy, as Virgil would say. Yeah. Um... And this is, um, this is where I come back to my discussion before about The Walking Dead. There was a character in oh, season... Oh, dear. <laughs> there was a oh, character... Dear. Season yeah. three is Zombie Kevin? No, uh, there was a scene in this season of The Walking Dead that was going on where they had tried to make everyone think that a character was dead. Um in the way they do, which is they hid some body parts under him below and they shot it in such a way that they're tearing out guts, but they're not that guy's guts. And they're, you know, they're trying to fool the audience. Mm -hmm. And that's when I, we, that's when I get off shows. Don't trick me like this. You know what I mean? 
and four episodes later, they show you that the guy's still alive. Spoilers. Kevin doesn't drink it, and it goes to credits. Kevin drinks it and has a seizure, presumably dies. It does die, but it doesn't go to credits then either. It goes the extra step. It shows the lifeline that they have set aside for Kevin is shot from the syringe onto the floor. After that, it shows his guide shoot himself in the head, and then Michael start to drag his corpse out. Right. And here's, here's why I'm so confused is because, A, all of that happens, so it's not like it, it leaves it on a really ambiguous note. B, knowing what I know of the show so far, I can't see Lindorf employing some convoluted, complicated flashback set of oh, but actually uh, Michael was hiding under the floorboards and it was actually a fake Kevin that he swapped out. and Kind of like... Um, Sherlock. Sherlock. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was going to say, that is really not what I anticipate happening. Um, partly because of what you said about Lindelof and how, how Lindelof approached the show and the idea of... I still haven't finished Lost, but the, the mystery box idea in Lost and Lindelof from what I've heard, tried to solve it and tried to come up with some kind of answer and people didn't like it. So the point of this one was, okay, there's not, I'm not going to try and solve these crazy mysteries. Um, and Kevin coming back to life, he would have to employ a pretty complicated solution, storytelling device, something. <laughs> He's gonna, he would have to do something pretty crazy for Kevin to be. So I, that's why I'm so confused because I know I know the show isn't one in which I can expect something like that to happen. Whereas in Sherlock, I was like, you know, it's it's a fun show, but that the storytelling is so kind of weird sometimes that it would allow for that. But but I just don't. I just that's why I was so confused because at the end of it, I was like, well, I just don't know how he's going to solve this. Um, given what I've seen of the show so far, like that's it. <laughs> that's how do you? what now and and that's how we were feeling then and that's that's a, and that and you know i want to end it here i want to go off on a, i want to watch this episode this next episode with you i think i think you're gonna like it and i mean that's all i have to say about a most powerful adversary to someone who hasn't seen the rest of the series mm-hmm. i'm gonna take this bull by the horns and say thank you very much for talking about this episode with me we have about an hour left in this day and i'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna watch International Assassin. Oh Maybe. wow! No, I've heard that name before. Yeah. And I've heard you reference that name before, so. Yeah. I know this is one of your favorites. Oh no! Go I was to... trying to lead you down the Primrose Pass and say it's not a very good episode. <laughs> I have an International Assassin poster on my. That's wall. what it is. That's what it is. Yep. That's what I've seen. The All name right. of this show is called International Assassin. So let's go find out about Tommy Garvey being an International Assassin. In Cairo. <laughs> In Cairo. Yeah. Totally. Um, hey, everybody, thanks for uh, checking out Six Years Later Leftovers Chat. We'll probably post a reaction video for International Assassin, uh, hopefully very soon, as long as Benji watches it with his glasses on so I can line up the HBO uh, logo again, which helped me a great deal. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I, uh, I'll explain it later. Okay. Um, all right, everybody, we'll talk to you soon. See ya. See ya.